In today's video, we're going to talk about the first part of the summary of the book, Thou Shalt Prosper, which is one of the most effective books on how to achieve financial abundance. But before we start, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and to click the bell icon to be notified for future videos. Thou Shalt Prosper was written by a Jewish rabbi named Daniel Lappin, which is a popular international speaker and author of multiple best-selling books. Throughout history and well into modern times, Jewish people have had a reputation for business acumen. This commercial savvy has often been presented in a negative light. However, in spite of these goyish aspersions, the ability to produce wealth that's often ascribed to Jewish people is now generally recognized as a positive and enviable attribute. But why have Jews become successful in business and how can it serve as inspiration for others? Here are the main lessons from the book. Lesson number one. Despite many misconceptions, Jews are successful in business because of education. If you're familiar with Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, you know that the Jewish character of Shylock is portrayed as a greedy and vengeful loan shark who's only interested in money. Unfortunately, this derogatory portrayal of the Jewish businessman has persisted. In addition to this negative image, there are many false theories about why Jews have tended to have business success. One absurd theory suggests that Jews evolved in such a way that money-making is simply part of their DNA. Jews have survived countless periods of persecution, so it's been suggested that only wealthy Jews survived these ordeals since they could buy their way out. Therefore, the future generations of Jews were born with a so-called money gene. Another nasty theory is that all Jews are cheaters. However, this enduring myth is refuted by the Torah, the holy book that defines Jewish law. It specifically calls for people to maintain an honest reputation when doing business. Any instances of cheating would be a direct offense against God. Then there's the conspiracy theory that Jews are part of some secret society. While it's true that community is an important part of Jewish life, Jews also tend to be very argumentative. So it's ridiculous to think they could keep some secret organization together and under wraps. People also often think of Jews as possessing superior intelligence. But intelligence generally doesn't increase monetary gain since people with higher IQs tend to become academics and scientists, not business leaders. When Jewish people do become successful, it's because they've received a good education at home and in a synagogue. A Jewish home is often filled with books, and the centrality of education in Jewish life is why Jews throughout history have had high literacy rates. This is also why, even though Jews only comprise 0.2% of the world's population, there is a disproportionately large number of books published every year concerning Jewish themes. In addition to the Torah's teachings, there is also oral traditions that continue to be passed down. A common lesson is to sacrifice present pleasures for future benefits. A reminder that putting in hard work today may well lead to a successful business tomorrow. Lesson number two. In Jewish tradition, business is seen as a good, morally honest and noble endeavor. It's not uncommon for corporations and businesses to be demonized by politicians and the media. And this can turn people's attention away from the job creation and the charitable work that comes from the private sector. On a more personal level, a healthy business venture can also make people feel better about themselves. It's not unlike someone being part of a clinical trial and being given a placebo. The patient often ends up feeling better just by being part of the program. The same can happen when someone is part of a noble business pursuit. Due to the teachings of the Torah, Jews will apply this kind of morality to doing business and earning money. Jewish wisdom teaches us that success only comes if the business has the approval of our friends. It's this approval that creates the passion and drive behind the endeavor. We're also urged to be virtuous and ethical. When we see ourselves as morally upright, running our business in an honest and ethical fashion, we're less likely to enter illegal or immoral territory. Of course, if someone gets away with cheating, they'll probably be tempted to cheat again. However, this can be prevented by atonement. Atonement, being at one with God, is an important part of Judaism. By atoning, one can reset after committing a bad deed. But to reset, one has first to learn from what one did wrong and diminish the temptation to repeat the behavior. Here's a little known fact. Jews join the banking profession in an effort to perform a noble service and help others. Jewish tradition views lending money as opposed to giving money away as a charitable act. By lending, others can start their own business and retain their independence and dignity in the process. This goes against another misconception, that Jews became bankers to escape oppression. Christians and Muslims tend to subscribe to a literal interpretation of the Bible that prohibits charging interest. 
But the oral traditions that was passed down, the Jewish laws that were not written in the Torah, taught Jews that there were moral circumstances that permit charging interest. Lesson number three, Jewish customs also teach us how to build successful relationships and strong networks. Now that you know some of the noble reasons for getting into business, let's take a look at how tradition can lead to successful business relationships. In a traditional Jewish workplace, co-workers are not unlike friends and family, but for those kinds of relationships to develop, they have to be genuine. People can sense false intentions, so it won't work if a friendly environment is forced. You might think of friends and family as being separate from business, but they can actually be a good source of inspiration. For Richard Simon, his personal relationship led him to become a pillar of the publishing world. As a child, Simon saw how much his grandmother and her friend loved doing the Sunday crossword puzzle together. But they would always finish it by Tuesday, which left them with four puzzleless days. Sensing a market for a book full of puzzles, Simon took the idea of his friend Lincoln Schuster, and before long, the publishing giant Simon & Schuster was born. The communal nature of traditional Jewish life also provides a helpful network of connections. Traditional Jewish prayer requires a quorum of 10 men called a minion. Every synagogue in every city has one. So whenever a Jewish businessman is traveling, he can join a minion and find a number of opportunities to form new relationships. And since this kind of network is always growing and evolving, there are always new possibilities. There are also teachings that can help form successful new relationships by allowing people to better understand themselves and how others perceive them. Once we clearly understand how others see us, we can change things about ourselves that might be hindering a successful relationship. These lessons about self-change are taught by Musar, a body of ancient Jewish literature. In this context, change doesn't simply mean changing how you appear, it also means changing how you really are. And with this understanding, relationships can take on a deeper, even spiritual meaning. Lesson number four, business isn't perfect, but Jewish tradition shows that imperfection isn't a bad thing. Are you a perfectionist? You end up working longer and harder than others because you're never satisfied until things are absolutely flawless. Well, trying to be perfect is a fool's errand because, in fact, nothing is perfect, especially when it comes to business. There is a Jewish belief called ethical capitalism, which reminds us that people are taught the ways of business by others and that this in turn can lead to corruption. It also reminds us that it's wrong to blame capitalism for the mistakes of a few capitalists. It helps to look at business as an inanimate object. You can't blame an object for causing problems. You can only blame the people who misuse it. Bernie Madoff is a perfect example. His Ponzi scheme cheated people out of millions of dollars by means of fraud and false trust. So we must hold Madoff accountable rather than blaming capitalism. Being moral in your business practices is a challenge since most actions can have both good and bad effects. When we look at the steel magnate Andrew Carnegie, and the railroad tycoon George Pullman, we see two people who improve society at a great cost to others. Carnegie is considered to be one of the greatest robber barons of the 19th century, and though Pullman pioneered U.S. railway expansion, he exploited his workers by charging them higher rates for housing and food. Some workers for the Pullman company owed more than they ever earned. But business, though far from perfect, doesn't have to be evil, and there are Jewish traditions that show how one can work morally within the business system. They say business is driven by greed, but Jews are taught that you must provide for yourself before you can help others. By turning people into customers, business is considered dehumanizing. But Jewish tradition offers a different perspective. Business emulates God's creativity by being a source of growth and inventiveness. Business is also sometimes blamed for creating inequality. However, without business, there would be no wealth to sustain the economy. And it's the government, not business, that's responsible for just redistribution of this wealth. Lesson number five, leaders are united by certain traits, which are often the result of tumultuous times. What comes to mind when you think of a great leader? There have been many great leaders over the years, and Jewish tradition shows us that there are certain characteristics that they all share. One of these characteristics is the ability to follow. Leaders often are or were followers. Even Moses, one of history's greatest leaders, had a mentor. God. Leaders also have a vision and a goal, and they're persuasive in telling people how they'll achieve it. God's vision was the world we see before us, and his goal was the Sabbath. That's why Jews celebrate the Sabbath every Friday night. And leaders aren't afraid of necessary confrontation. The necessity of confrontation is driven home by the tale of Joseph. 
Joseph's brothers, envious of the favor shown him by their father, plotted to kill Joseph. One of these brothers, Judah, instead of confronting his brothers, compromised and suggested they sell Joseph into slavery. This cost Judah his role as leader. If he had stood up to his brothers, he's likely they would have listened to him and never attempted to kill or enslave Joseph. Leaders also use the power of faith. The power of faith can come in different forms. The most obvious is perhaps daily prayer. Less obvious is the ability to have faith in oneself and to instill that personal faith in others so that goals are achieved. And leaders carry themselves with a respectful presence. There's a reason the Talmud, an ancient collection of rabbinical doctrines, calls the lion the king of beasts. It's not the biggest or strongest animal, but it earns its respect through its regal posture and careful movements. Another thing to consider is that there is no single definition of a leader, and that they fill many roles, guiding people through change, being an inspiring role model, or helping people develop, for example. More often than not, people don't become leaders by learning these skills. The role is thrust upon them under extraordinary circumstances. Many believe that New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani would never have been considered a notable leader if it hadn't been for the chaotic and tumultuous events of 9-11. But this event brought out the leader in Giuliani, and he did an able job of guiding the city out of crisis. So guys, this concludes the first part of our summary of the book Thou Shall Prosper by Daniel Lappin. I placed a link in the book below this video. Give us a thumbs up and see you in the next video. Until then, keep smiling. Please subscribe to my channel if you have not done it yet. And don't forget to click the notification button. I hope you guys learned and enjoyed this video. Thank you and have a great day.